Good morning, friends. So we're back to my blog here. This is called um, Grain of Sand. That's an allusion to a poem by William Blake, actually. And I'm scrolling through my latest on Monday, Feb 10. This is uh, Wednesday, Feb 12 today, showing my embedded YouTube from last time, from Monday. And I'm kind of nudging here at local Jesuits. It's kind of tying in my resume, which has a lot of overlap with like Catholic institutions, right? I used to work at uh, St. Dominic Academy as a high school math teacher. That was way back in the early 80s as a math teacher, also world history teacher. They were a small school, a well-regarded private school. And I had a good time there. That was my first job out of Princeton University. While I was going there, I, I was also taking classes at St. Peter's College, which was like halfway between my place and the school, mostly to build up my resume as a wannabe high school teacher. Once I did get that job, which is the goal, then I didn't see the need to keep taking those classes. But for a while there, I was uh, bouncing around greater New York City, greater New Jersey, or greater Jersey City, looking for interviewing for teaching jobs. It was kind of like when I decided not to go to grad school and more like to follow this other trail with the um, Applewhites, you could say, that wasn't how it worked directly. Like, Ed Applewhite was not like immediately my friend or anything, even though he, he was kind of a gatekeeper. He was trying to keep the Fuller legacy in pristine shape. Like where would the papers go when Fuller died? That was still a question uh, because when I first started working in this area, Fuller was very much still alive. But uh, Ed and I got along after a while. I'll show you a gift he gave me. Um, as I scroll down through this, he came out to Oregon with his wife, June, to hang out. This doesn't He didn't get out of D.C. much in those days. He was like 80-plus years old. I was a real privilege to drive him around. Actually, June spent more of her time in the uh, Arlington Club, and uh, she did go out to dinner with us and stuff like that, right? So he gave me this book, Symmetry. See, one of my big questions in in Facebook after that video and so on is, okay, so here's one of the great futurists who invents interesting math stuff that's very accessible at the high school, middle school, even elementary school level, and we don't teach it. And what is our reasoning exactly? Anyway, Symmetry by Isvan Hargitay. This was um, a gift to me from Ed Applewhite, and he wrote in the front here, it says, For Kirby Erner, with particular appreciation for his role in the net. He was kind of seeing me as, this was December 94, right? Now, who is Istvan Hargitay? I'm going to show you a book by him. Five Physicists Who Changed the 20th Century by Isvan Hargitay. And it's called, it's called Martians of Science. Now, I do this thing called Martian math. The connection's a little tenuous. My, my Martian more like just means I'm bringing in futurism and science fiction. And this Martians of Science, I would say, refers to Hungarians, right? Hungarian immigrants to North America who made a big, big difference. Now, in the Hargitay uh, connection there, if I go to the bottom of the Applewhite page, remembering when he came to uh, visit, I visited him in D.C. quite a bit, too, on many occasions. We'd go out to dinner and stuff. And then the last time I was in D.C. and we were going to meet, that's when I found out my wife had breast cancer. I was at a conference, a Python conference, which then turned into a Bucky symposium. They were scheduled 
uh, back to back in the same, almost the same uh, room. It was like at uh, what George Washington University, right? So I had to go home right away because she went from no nothing. She went from zero to stage three overnight, you could say. So I didn't see Applewhite again after that. But we stayed in touch, of course, talked on the phone, stuff like that. So uh, the naming of Buckminster Fullery, he was very concerned or keen to see that C60, 60 carbon, molecule, 60 carbon atoms making a single molecule following the pattern of a soccer ball or more carbon still in that shape. And then came bucky tubes or nanotubes, the whole thing of graphene, sheet carbon. The age of carbon, we were talking about this in the, what, 80s, right? So this was like 95 uh, chemical intelligencer uh, published Applewhite. Uh, let's see, what, what does it say? Okay, this article came out in 95. So shortly after... I got this symmetry book by Isvan and his wife from Ed. Then Ed's in touch with Isvan at that time, and they uh, they put this article in where Bucky we're not Bucky where Applewhite talks about the naming of Buckminster Fullerene, and I add some pictures to it here. I got permission from Ed to do this. He was fine with it. And uh, so the article lives on here at my website, just scrolling through it. So here's a little bio of Ed. If I click on this, I don't even remember where that goes. Maybe back to his visit or what? It looks like, okay, it goes back to the visit and now it's bigger for some reason. Okay, what else? We have his obit. Let's see if that still works. So my big question is, given all this history and interesting mathematics and humanities stuff, what is it that's keeping people from teaching any of it, especially given its accessibility? I'm hoping things like my use of arbitrary precision verifying computations around the S module and so on. You really, it's just tetra volumes is the key idea, right? That we're measuring volumes in terms of unit tetrahedrons. Not that hard to grasp. And one could say it's trivial or something like that. And I think that would be, if I'm trying to defend against teaching any of this, that's my approach. If, I, if I'm a debate guy and I'm trying to like not let this stuff in the schools, I'll say, well, is trivial, meaning it's true, I admit it's true, but I don't want to see it as important in any way, so I'll say it's trivial. But I think before we make that decision for people, we should give them at least a sense of what we plan to withhold, like what we're not going to teach you, the great wisdom of whoever, not my decision, my emphasis and push since Princeton has been, no, we need to share these like math memes right away and I think the cost of not doing it is always higher and higher. I'm going by my opportunity cost picture here in GST2, right? General Systems Theory. When I write opportunity cost down at the bottom between the relative dystopia and relative utopia, they're, they're relative terms, I admit it. It's like people get down on utopia. Well, does that mean that you're into dystopia? There's relativeness here. And the angle of difference, right? This creates what, what I would call our opportunity cost, which is our collective living standards. If we keep within like the 1950s concepts, let's say we only think like someone in the 1950s. Okay, maybe we uh, we don't know anything about general systems theory, for example. We're still thinking in terms of communists versus capitalists and some kind of world domination. And, and we're pretty ignorant of the solar dynamics, the fact of where energy comes from. We haven't really incorporated that into economics yet. 
it's 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 kind of a mess and as decades roll by our concepts expand and here we get like Aquarian Conspiracy Marilyn Ferguson's book and like a new hope I would say in the 60s 70s 80s where people are realizing partly under Fuller's tutelage that no we could actually push out living standards and at that point you realize it's not worth, in fact, it's more like either or. If you're going to spend all your money and brains, take all your talented engineers and push them into developing war stuff, killingry as Bucky called it, your opportunity cost there is pretty huge, right? Like we all pay. We get a ghetto planet instead of a planet to be proud of. So... I think the costs of withholding all this information has been very, very high. And it would be a good idea for teachers out there to join me. I would welcome swelling the ranks here and taking this American heritage, which I'm not claiming to have invented. So this is not like self-promotion in the sense that you must teach the math that I came up with. It's like no, this stuff was already in the in the in the junk pile when I came across it and already being in the process of being thrown away. And I'm saying this is too good to throw away. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? So that's where I go back <clears throat> and kind of nudge the Catholics here. Cuz I would see that, you know, if you're teaching in a so-called public school, Especially in the math world, you've got common core, you're locked in on a set of standards. The whole point there is to create conformity and uniformity. We're all going to teach from the same page. It's some kind of ideal people have that schools should not differentiate much, on, especially in math. There's just this co common core. The idea says it all. We all need to know this common core. Now, I agree, we do. We all need to know how to add, subtract. Basically, the al khwarizmi stuff, the algorithms that we get from Persia, Baghdad, stuff like that. We teach that. I call ba Baghdad, I call Algebra City sometimes, just to remind myself. It's a mnemonic, Algebra City. Okay, we do need to teach that, but when we get to geometry and Euclidean stuff and so on, uh, actually, we need to fork off more now into number theory than we used to. When we talk about prime and composite numbers... That's a fun, easy part of math, but we just blow through it because we're not used to the idea of, say, cryptography requiring gigantic prime numbers and how do you get them, all that kind of side trip. We don't do that, the crypto stuff. So there's another, I would say, super weakness in the current curriculum, and you've heard me address how I could uh, see dealing with it, with the two tracks, lambda calculus and delta calculus, delta is Calculus is what we have now. We talk about pre-calculus, calculus. You go through high school, college bound. They <clears throat> they expect you to, to go on the delta calculus track. But do you, what do you learn in terms of lambda calculus? Which I've expanded to mean all this kind of computer science, including a geometric um, CAD kind of approach. C60, flextegrity is what I've been taking most advantage of in terms of actual artifacts to share around and display. We had a whole museum of that in downtown Portland at the end of last year. Lots of videos on that. But uh, there's a lot of toys, like Design Science Toys, now out of business, had a whole line of toys. There's Zome. So, like, there's a huge subculture or potentially huge subculture just waiting to be set free by what about private school literature teachers? Like I'm saying, I think if you're in the public school system, you're pretty much locked in. They've got you, right? You're a prisoner of this so-called common core, whatever they call it. But if you're a literature teacher, can't you just do uh, enough of a side trip into this American transcendentalism to at least pick up the basics of the concentric hierarchy, 12 around 1? I'll end with another book by Ed Applewhite. This was his adventure, just getting synergetics out there, right? So he was Fuller's collaborator on the synergetics two volumes, Macmillan, late 70s, early 80s. 
got these out. He also worked hard to get Cosmography out. That was a posthumous book by Fuller. Kyoshi Kuramiya was the other chief collaborator at the time, and I hang out with him too in Philadelphia. I would go to AFSC meetings, Quaker meetings, American Friends Service Committee. They would send me there. The Quakers here would send me there as a delegate. And I think I had that stint maybe a couple times. And so I would meet with um, Kiyoshi Kiramiya and uh, Medard Gabel, Chris Fernley. Other literature we have, Jacob's play, which came here to Portland. I met Allegra at that play. That's Fuller's daughter. Here's the Polish version. And it's been playing in Poland actually pretty recently. So Fuller has an international audience. You'll see he's uh, cited in German philosophy these days. He's already in academia around the corner, around the fringes. I'm thinking that high school is more towards the center, actually. It's lower down in the tree, towards the roots, right? And this is from a famous exhibit um, that had these books come out in connection with it. There are two of them. This is the thicker one, and this is just full of hard-to-find pictures from Fuller's career, his long career. This is the house on a pole, the so-called Dymaxian yurt and so on. I call it a yurt. Lots of videos on that. You can find a later prototype at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. So again, very important futurist who not just as a writer, in fact, I would say that what stands out about Fuller is he believed in creating archetype, art, uh, artifacts. And in a way, that's probably why philosophers don't want to compete with the guy, because they don't have any patents, and he just doesn't fit the pigeonhole. You know, but if people like Leibniz and Pascal and so on, who are very eclectic and dabbled in technology... To survive today, they probably would have had to patent a bunch of stuff too, right? In this age of intellectual property and privatization of things, um, you know, a polymath, I guess I'm what, I, what, what I'm saying, a polymath would probably have a lot of patents. So let's just go back to calling Fuller a polymath and then teach the math part. Kind of like Yang says, make America think harder. I'm going to stick with the, I know Yang's bowing out after New Hampshire last night, but that doesn't mean he's not still a leader and making America think harder, math, I'm with him. All right, talk to you soon.